fractures. But so what I want you guys to look at are these. The big take-home point is non-displaced hip fractures. Don't miss them. Okay. There does not have to be trauma in an old person with osteoporotic bone. Uh, they can just say, I did not fall, but they have a hip fracture. Okay. So any elderly person that doesn't want to bear weight that's complaining of joint pain and it was like acute pain out of nowhere. Now, you're going to have to distinguish between hip arthritis <coughs> and hip fracture pain. Obviously, hip fracture pain is immediate. You know, started one day ago or started <coughs> three hours ago. Okay? But just assume it's a non-displaced hip fracture whether you can see it on x-ray or not, especially if they're laying in the bed with their legs looking like that. So shortened and externally rotated. Before you even look at this person's hip or their x-rays, they probably got a right hip fracture somewhere. Right? In young people, fractures and or dislocations of the hip require quite a bit of force. So they're usually going to be car wrecks, falls from heights, um, significant trauma. Bo Jackson had his hip dislocated um, in a football game. <coughs> Google that one and watch that. Bo Jackson's hip dislocation. His was so bad, he actually ended up having to have, he got ABN and ended up having to have his hip replaced when he played on a hip replacement. So yep. I heard, I uh, like watched, and I've seen some documentary about him or something, and I think they were saying that <coughs> most people couldn't even his muscle mass was so big, right? But they think that contributed to why he dislocated his, his hamstrings and quads were so strong and overpowered his own joint. So the main thing is I want you to know the difference between femoral neck fracture and interfrocanteric back fracture. When you guys were taught hip fractures what? in musculoskeletal module, did you go much beyond those two major distinctions? Okay. So for ER, the main things are, is it in the femoral neck, is it in the acetabulum, or is it in the intertrochanteric space okay, or area? So this, this slide demonstrates on the left-hand side of the top, there's a hip fracture. Can you see it on the x-ray? I can't see it on the x-ray. We're going to assume that this lady up there is 85 years old, osteoporotic, has all the signs and symptoms of a hip fracture. You can't see it on x-ray. So you refer her to an orthopedic surgeon for a follow-up, and they do a CT, and she's obviously got a hip fracture. Okay. This one on the right-hand side, you can just see it. I can see it in the way. You can just see it. There's just some that right there. It doesn't look quite right. Okay, it's just a little bit of incongruity in the cortical bone. So it's very subtle. So that's what I want you to know. You're not for a while going to be able to pick that up. So use your clinical exam. Use your talking to the patient. Use your history to figure that out, and you leave it on your differential. Get them into more deep search. Then you've got this guy where it's very obvious. Okay, this person's going to be. Please, everybody, tell me you can see that fracture. Yeah. Right? Everybody's nodding. Right? Okay. This is this is the one you're. It's easy to pick up because this leg is probably short, externally rotated. It's going to be easy to diagnose. And then here's, that, so that one was a femoral neck. This is an intertrochanter, right? They're treated differently. I'm sure Jamie talked to you guys about that. This one is so subtle. You can just look at this for a minute see if you can find a fracture. Anybody see it? So this is more in the cup. So, so. A couple more where all you can see, remember we're talking about slip capital fem uh, femoral epiphysis, so if you can use that, those uh, Kearney's lines, to kind of see if that 
turning, turning along, see if that cup has <coughs> slipped off with the cone, or slipped off the, the ice cream, slipped off the cone. And then this inner trochanteric fracture is just lucent. You don't really see, um, you just see a lucency here. But if you look closely, and it's always a good idea to look at the edge, look at the periosteum. Right here, you'll see it's kind of incongruent right there, right? You guys are like, no. <laughs> okay, hip dislocations. Anybody talk to y'all about that? Mm -hmm. You don't have to say much, you're okay. So, what's the most common? Posterior mm -hmm. hip dislocations are the most common. This this one is a true emergency. Obviously, your treatment is reduction, right? So, posterior hip dislocations, just think about it like a kneeboard injury in a car wreck, pops it out the back so the hip's going to fall in. It's going to internally rotate, okay? And that's, again, that's 90% of dislocations. See this on X-ray? The femoral head's going to look like it's behind and up in relation to the acetabulum. Okay. Anterior hip dislocations look different when they're laying in the bed, as you can see here. These are very uncommon. If they do happen, the, the patients usually have a have a hip prosthesis, and the hip prosthesis has popped out. Not in this guy's case. So when this when it dislocates anteriorly, the uh, femoral head is going to look medial and down. So most people like the big load. Who's big load mover? I guess. Um, you have to have an assistant with this, and this is not easy. So hopefully, maybe one of you will get to help a preceptor do it, but I, the only time I've ever done is with the patient in the OR sleep, so those are a lot easier to do. But I'm, I was the one doing the dislocating, and then relocating. Okay. Has anyone talked to y'all about pelvic fractures yet? And musculoskeletal? Yes, no, not a lot. Anatomy, talked about pelvic fractures. Okay, that's been a long time ago. So, mortality rate is high as 20% of the fractures uh, just because of the, the risk of hemorrhage. So, there's two basic groups you can group these people into big paradigms, low energy trauma or high energy trauma. Your young people with high energy trauma, got hit by a car, in a car wreck, they're going to have more, tend to have more unstable fractures, worse fractures. The low energy I just fell and my pelvis broke, it's more your older patients, those are typically going to be more stable fractures. Uh, those are just two big, big groups. Okay? So AP pelvis. Uh, X-ray to confirm this, who suspected, maybe a CT scan. So think about fract pelvic fractures in four, four groups, okay? And just, just take the bottom two out right off the top. They fracture just the acetabulum. Technically, that's a pelvic fracture, but it's not a, not a huge deal. And then the sacrococcygeal fractures, okay? Those are not, not a huge deal. So you want to mostly think about fractures, whether they fracture, the person fractured the ring or not, okay? So anytime somebody comes in with a pelvic fracture, you've got to look at their perineum. You've got to look down in the nether regions because they will hemorrhage badly. And they may, it may look totally normal right here. But you need to get up under there and look at their perineum, at the scrotum. This person's really bad. So if you fracture 
anteriorly in the pelvis, there's a pretty high risk of urogenital trauma of some kind. So these patients, they may be bleeding out their urogenital tract. Okay? So skin survey, look for bruising at the anterior abdominal wall, the flanks, sacrum, luteal region. But just because you don't see bruising doesn't mean there's not hemorrhage inside. So what the hell do I order if I suspect? If I look at somebody and they've got that, you, it ain't at least an AP pelvis. The patient probably is just going to get a bedside, roll the x-ray in and get a bedside AP pelvis and that's it. If you can get five views of the pelvis, then you can order a five view of the pelvis. But if it's a very obvious injury with bleeding, you know, this kid, person is in a car wreck, or hit by a car, pedestrian, pretty obviously has a pelvic, pelvis fracture, and AP pelvis is probably sufficient. Because they're going to end up getting a <coughs> CT scan anyways. And then if you suspect you're a genital trauma, you need to do a urine drop if you see here. So think of the pelvis as a ring. And think in your mind, if it's broken in one part of the ring, it's probably broken in a second part of the ring. You guys have ever taught that. Okay. It's going to be disrupted in two places. So you can have fractures of the pelvis that don't necessarily involve the ring, like this fracture. Okay? Or you have the fractures that involve the ring, and again, if you see one, look for a second. So three ways to, to think about this. Anterior to posterior compression. <coughs> this is like I was walking down the street, got hit by a car, and the car broke my pelvis. This is an open. This is opening the book. Okay, basically you're breaking the pubic symphysis and opening the pelvis up. Okay, if, for that to happen, it could just be a slight, you know, a slight disturbance where we see type one or it can break so badly and spread so far apart that it breaks the back of the pelvis as well, okay? So you need to pay attention to, the, to that joint. And if you see a symphysis opening, you need to look um, at the sacroiliac joint back there. Lateral compression is like I was riding in the car and the car hit me, side impact, <coughs> and broke my pelvis. Dr. Britton did that on ice, icy road one year, so uh, spun out and ran into like the barrier and it, basically his hip hit the concrete barrier and broke his pelvis. So those, those lateral compressions, again it depends on the amount of force, but if you see those pubic rami broken, look at, look at other places to be sure there's no disruption. You also need to look at the contralateral side because if, if the disruption is bad enough over here, you lost so much stability on this side, you're gonna, it's gonna, the force is going to have to come out somewhere else. So once you start thinking about fractures that way, like it's a force applied, it has to go, it's like electrocution, it has to go in and out from somewhere. So if it's enough, if it's enough force, it will go out the opposite side. Okay? And then the vertical shear injuries are the super bad really at risk for hemorrhaging and dying, okay? So this is like a high fall and like landing on one leg. Those are extremely unstable. How cool are those? <coughs> I've never seen one of that oh. But um, it would just depend on the amount of trauma sustained. So that, this is not going to be your little old lady that just fell in her bathroom and broke her pelvis. This is going to be like a roofer fell off a three-story building and landed on one leg. It probably has other injuries, you know, probably has some broken calcaneus and tibia and dislocated hip and vertical shear pelvic fracture. So these are going to a level one trauma center. That's an open book injury. That's, that's bad and going to have to be fixed. This person is going to be at risk for your genital injury as well. This 
one, the red circle shows you, what you're supposed to be paying attention to. But so this one you've got fractures. You've got this fracture. You've got this fracture. And then it also fractured the transverse process of the so when you just kind of glance at it, it doesn't look that bad. When you start looking around, you're like, oh yeah. The other joints you want to look at too, which look okay in this x-ray or the, the sacroiliac joints, they both look pretty much intact in the normal position. This one, you already know right off the top when you look at it, you see that the pubic symphysis is widened, right? So where else has it broken? Well, first of all, the acetabulum is trashed on this side. You see that? And then the sacroiliac joint on that same side is broken too. You can tell it's widened. It's widened right here. This is unstable. Patients cannot wait back on this. They need surgery. So Pearls to think about with pelvic fractures. The treatment is to stabilize it, right? So how severe the injury is tells you how much stabilization you have to do. You might be able to just wrap them up in a cloth and just kind of hold them together until you get into the OR. Okay? In the, in the operating room, they're going to externally fix um, and then go in and probably, they'll probably let him sit like that, let the swelling go down and operate in a day or two. So curls, if it's, if the fracture's posterior, you got to check for neurovascular injuries. If it's anterior, watch out for the urogenital injuries. Don't put catheter in these people. You haven't learned fast exam yet, but fast exam is less sensitive. There's a pelvic fracture, just tuck that away for later. And then the treatment is to close the book, stabilize, depending on how severe the disruption is, determines what surgery is going to be done. You just get into ortho. If it's, if it's stable, um, you can let them walk on this. So it's really just, you just, your job in the ER is just to determine if it's stable or not. Okay? If it's stable, they can walk with a walker. Hurts, but they can do it. If it's stable, it won't displace anymore. Ankle dislocations, again, true orthopedic emergency. <coughs> you can see here that the skin is not, doesn't look really bad, but the, if you sit around on that for a couple of hours, it starts to look like this. Okay? You start getting that serious vascular injury, you potentially lose a foot. You don't treat that. Don't discharge ankle dislocations without the orthopedist seeing them before they leave. They're not leaving or anything. They're going to be admitted. The ortho needs to see them. Okay, Mason, Mason knew injury. The, always, always, always remember when you have an ankle injury and you get an x ray. Check the medial clear space of the joint. Dr. Flowers talked to you about the talus and the, the, the joint and the medial clear space. So, you guys need to look at a lot of normal x-rays. You should be able to look at that and know that that's too wide. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, if there's too much space medially, you've got to assume there's a syndesmotic rupture or injury of some kind and that the joint is unstable. I don't see a fracture there, do you? No. But you know by this medial clear space, this widening, that there's injury bad enough for the ankle to be unstable. They can't walk around on it, okay? You've got to actually the proximal fibula to see that, okay? So some providers in the ER, I don't know, I've never worked first line in the ER, but you may just, and your ankles get a proximal fibula. 
you can wait and see if it's if it's wide there and if it's wide, send them back for a proximal fibula. But if you want to order it all together, you can. But that this widens this widened medial through space shows that the force went out somewhere. It went in through the medial side, through the syndesmosis, and out the proximal fibula. Okay, so don't forget to x-ray your proximal fibulas. <coughs> this injury, if you just look down here, it doesn't look that bad. But the ankle is extremely unstable. So if you were to send them away, like, oh, you sprained your ankle, and the weight bear is tolerated, use some crutches for a couple days, it's bad. So don't forget to check the proximal fibula. And if you see that fracture, that's a amazing new injury. Okay, questions on that? <coughs> there, I have a video on detail, you all can watch about that. Liz Fromm, I remember this one, there's a lot of old dead guy names to remember on this lecture. Liz Fromm, injury, doesn't have to be broken to be injured. Again, it's one of these space, you need to be able to recognize that there, there shouldn't be this gap right there. Okay, so you're looking for those spaces. So you need to kind of make yourself a list when you're on your ER rotation of what bones, you know, they may not be broken, but they may be injured enough that, that there's spaces where there shouldn't be spaces. Okay? And the list of injuries are limited. Because again, there's no fracture in that x-ray, so, but you cannot send them home walking on that. Okay? So just know how to diagnose that. Because they've got to go home, non-weight bearing, and a posterior splint, and go see the orthopedic surgeon in a day or two. These are fairly hard to injure. It's usually an injury with a, uh, if your foot extended and you go this way, down on it with your foot, all like that. Yes? What does it look like when you do that? You would uh, put screws in it, close that, <coughs> you would close that gap. And that's a hard injury to heal from. Okay, splinting. Who has any experience splinting? It's kind of fun. You guys need to get good at this while you're on rotations, okay? I've seen medical students put on the shittiest splints. <laughs> As nurse practitioners put on the shittiest splints. I do not want my students to be lumped into that category. I want the preceptor say the OCUPA is put on the best splints, okay? So, rule number one is you never, ever, ever, ever cast a swollen limb. You never, ever, ever, ever cast in the ER. There is no reason to put a cast on in the ER, okay? Um, if it's an acute injury, they're presenting to the ER, they're going to get a splint, okay? The other wonderful thing about a splint is the immobilization is actually providing analgesia. You know, I don't need to give you those, you know, 15 milligram Percocet, ma'am. I put a nice, comfortable splint on you, okay? And two extra strength Tylenol every four to six hours will do just fine. And so a good splint is pain relief, okay? A bad splint is pain causing. So, again, don't put on crappy splints. <clears throat> Most of what you're going to deal with in the world today is going to be fiberglass, you know, pre-made, covered, ready to go, splinting, where you can just pull it out of the box and cut however much you want to squeeze. The, there's, I put videos on D12. The, those not, won't necessarily be, the videos themselves are not going to take a lot of test questions from, but you need to watch all of those before capstone, before you do your casting and splinting, okay? You need to go into capstone already having prepared to come in and practice it. Okay? So at some point in time, watch all of those, please. So two big pet peeves on this is don't soak the patient. It's, it's ready to go fiberglass. You add the water and then bring the excess water out. Okay. So again, you'll see those on the videos. He lays his, lays his splint out. He uses a bottle of water, just wets it down a little bit, rolls it up to squeeze out the excess, 
and then he's ready to go. Don't soak a patient. In fact, I've seen some shitty splints been put on in the ER where they soaked the patient so bad, you get them in the clinic two days later, their foot is macerated just from just being wet and nasty. So don't soak the patient with this blood water. Um, don't stab the patient with fiberglass, okay? Fiberglass is inside the padding. I should have brought some to show you. Pull the pad, you know, pull the soft padding out away from the fiberglass edges, okay? Don't cut it and then let the fiberglass poke out from the inside and stab the patient. Okay, so just be aware of that. And then you need to know what is what, when do I put what on, <coughs> and practice. And a big take home. <coughs> Assess neurovascular status. You will have already done it before you put the splint on, but you need to recheck it after you put the splint on and you need to document it. Okay. So here is what the orthoblast uh, ready to go splints look like. You basically just pull this out of the box, decide how much you need, and just trim off what you need. And then seal it back down with this black. It's basically just a crimper. It's like a crimps it down so that air won't get into the packaging because that if you let air get into the packaging, it's gonna harden and ruin that entire box. Three inch bandages, which usually you need for upper extremity and four inch for lower. <coughs> Don't be stingy with your soft roll. There's a lot of soft roll. There are some rural ERs may still do plaster. So we use plaster in our uh, surgery centers because it's cheap, save us money. Plaster is really pretty cool to work with because you can kind of mold it and it's fun and messy. But you're going to see this orthoblast most, most of the time. All right, here's your, you know, you know it's going to have a chart for you, right? <laughs> so this is just where's the patient injured and what kind of split am I going to put on? Okay, I'll come study up on that later. Another take home, and when Travis comes and teaches you, I'm sure he's going to give you guys the same information. Please know what intrinsic plus is, intrinsic plus position. Sit your, everybody sit their arms up on them. When you sit and relax, doesn't your wrist kind of naturally go into flexion a little bit? Mm -hmm. We aren't sitting around like this with our hands. Splitting sitting like this is extremely uncomfortable. After a few hours of in being in a splint like this, they will hit your guts. <laughs> you need to put them in a little bit of wrist, <coughs> excuse me, I said flexion, a little bit of wrist extension. <coughs> because this is not natural. Either this or this is natural. Okay? So just remember, don't splint people with Barbie hands. Okay? Splint, splint them with a little bit of wrist extension. Okay? And their fingers, their MP joints are a little bit flexed. All of your ortho techs you've ever worked with will love your guts if you know how to do that. Sugar tong, most with upper extremity injuries, both bones, elbows, distal radiuses, from the ER they're going to get a sugar tong. Okay? You can do just a basic sugar tong, which is just around the forearm, or you can do um, put that extra bit of stability here. If it's an elbow injury and you want extra stability, you can put that second piece on the top. And most of them are just going to go around the floor. Okay. This one, you want to pay attention to how bony your patient is. Um, like with the oldest styloid, you want to pad that up. You want to pad up these, you know, any bony promises that stick out. Put extra padding in there. So extra soft roll. Pad up the, the elbow, pad up the little start with. Volar splint is just putting the splinting apparatus on the volar side. Okay? The key there is always put them in intrinsic plus, a little bit of wrist extension and the flexion. And also, do not splint them all the way up to their elbow. <coughs> We're just wanting to splint the wrist. Don't take your splint all the way up to here because when they bend, it's going to rub and rub and rub every time they flex their elbow. So always put it about two inches 
distal to the antecubital muscle. Okay? Thumb spica. This is just basically taking what you would have used for a volar splint and moving it over to the side so you're immobilizing the thumb. Okay? So scapeloids, thumb injuries. Again, lots of soft roll. Check the thumb. Don't soak the patient. That's a bad one too. If you soak them with a the thumb spica, it sits right in there. And they'll come back just cut the macerated skin. It's awful. Older gutters, so boxer fractures, fourth and fifth meta, metacarpal and phalanx fractures. Um, and you'll get more of this in capstone, but the, the technique is to immobilize the uh, ring and small finger together, okay? leaving the thumb, uh, index, and wall out. <coughs> And you want to immobilize the MP <coughs> joints and a bit of flexion and the PIPs and the little flexion. And this is our uh, blocking splint. So if you have flexor tendon injuries, this is the kind of splint you actually, it's just the opposite of a volar splint. You're just going to put the splint on the back of the hand to block extension. So if somebody says we need a blocking splint, they mean they need a blocking extension. Usually for flexor tendons, and you can also use them for uh, second and third metacarpal fractures as well. If you want to block that motion. <coughs> Posterior short legs are fun. Depends on how big the leg is. It can get interesting. Um, my take homes on this are pad the bones, pad the bony prominences, the lateral mount especially, need them out to um, immobilize it in, ang in neutral, try not to immobilize it in plantar flexion, try not to immobilize it in too much dorsiflexion, try to get as neutral as you can. Don't leave the toes hanging. See people, people put posterior splints on and then they'll drop the splint and about the end of the splint will be right here because they didn't cut enough fiberglass. Go back and cut some more fiberglass. That's so ridiculous. You should actually almost have it too much. As you can see, they've kind of folded it over and have extra comfort for the toes. Okay. And again, back of the knee. Same principle as the antecubital fossa. Don't split them up into their elbow pit. Don't split them up into their arm pit. Don't split them up into their knee pit either. You know, a couple of inches. Leave a couple of inches of clearance there. So when they flex their knee, they're not rubbing the back of their leg. <clears throat> in fact, in fact they, it's four finger rests. You should give a little bit more clearance for the back of the leg. All right. You'll get more information on splinting when we get to capstone. So 